Right, thank you everyone for coming. Um, oh, oh you okay? <laughs> they they rock. Rock. No, they I rock. know that. They rock back. Yeah. I've had the opportunity to be Dr. Tanya Milligan's tour guide today. Um, She's been wonderful. Trip. You've been amazing. Um, so You're been, hired. It's been a great day. <laughs> <laughs> great busy day. Um, I'm going the structure of the next hour, hour and ten minutes. I'm going to have Dr. Milligan talk just a little bit about her experience and what brought her in to Oxford, as well as what your experience was like today touring our district. Um, then I'll open it up to questions from you guys who could pass the mic because it is being live streamed today. And then Dr. Milligan does have some questions for the community. So if we could just leave a couple minutes at the end for her to pose questions back. So. I'm going to hand it over to you, Tanya. Thank you. you. Tell us a little bit about your experience, why you're interested in Oxford. Absolutely. And what yeah. It's like yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me back. That was very exciting to get that call. So I appreciate the opportunity um, to be here today. Um, so Tanya Milligan, 31 years in education. I was a science teacher. I was a teacher leader working with my colleagues to strengthen our practice in math and science. Um, I was an assistant principal for six-ish years and um, a principal of a high school for seven years. I currently, this is my second year in um, as an executive director um, in Columbus, Ohio. We have, it's a large urban district, 45,000 students, so very large, um, 113 schools. So a different scenario than here, uh, quite a bit different. One of the reasons um, when the opening was brought to my attention, um, it was shared with me in a sense that, you know, when you look at the leadership profile and you look at your experience um, with trauma and trauma-informed schools, um, it, was, it was parallel. Like when I read through it, I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. What they're saying and what I'm reading, what, you know, students and community and, you know, staff are looking for, these are skills that I've developed throughout my career um, in, in, you know, multiple positions. Um, the, uh, probably the one that aligns the most is my role as a principal um, for my students um, for a variety of reasons um, who experience trauma, sometimes on a daily basis. Um, they have life circumstances that just create non-academic barriers for them. And so it was my number one priority to figure out what we needed to do differently in the school to create a school that uh, gave them a sense of belonging, that um, understood their needs and ways in which we could support those needs. Um, and so I, I spent seven years trying to really make sure that when kids walked in my school, they knew that we loved them. We, they knew that we were there for their best interest um, and to provide them a rigorous education while simultaneously providing wraparound services for them because um, they go hand in hand, right? They're not, they're not separate, they, they go together. Um, and so reading, you know, reading the profile, really I did a lot of research, um, watched board meetings, read a lot um, to truly understand the challenges that Oxford um, is facing and, you know, someone, if you're not in the community, it's hard to truly understand everything that you've been through. But at the same time, um, coming at, at the work through a trauma-informed lens and understanding um, what the community is saying through that lens and what they need um, is a critical aspect of the work. And um, I would say one of my strongest skills is that I really take the time and energy to listen, right? And not just listen, um, for the words, but also listen, listen for the emotions behind the word, like what is driving that? There's, there's more to listening than just listening for words. It's the emotions 
Um, it's that empathy piece, and because you can't understand what's happening, especially you know here in the community and everything you're you're working through without connecting in that way. So those are the things that really intrigued me about Oxford. Um, you know, it, it's the only school district I've applied to. <laughs> there are no other school districts that I've applied to. And it's only because I see the connection. I see the fit. I see how my skills can support um, the work of the community. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. You know, I wasn't looking for a superintendent's job. I was looking for a community to serve in the role as superintendent, right? And so that's the, the highlight, you know, every time I look at the leadership profile and I, uh, or I watch a, a board meeting, um, there is just this sense in me that I need to be in Oxford. So it, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to be logical about that. It's just, it's something I'm, I'm driven to do. Um, and, and I appreciate even being considered so, um, so that's me and that's my background and that's what, what you know, is, is interesting me in Oxford, not to mention the fact I came up here last week. The temperature was a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> my husband and I, we love to hike, we love to be outside, so we did end up going to um, the Bald Mountain um, and, and like we're walking, it was sunny and it was beautiful and then today, <laughs> I'm like, wow. Um, but it's just a beautiful area. Um, I was amazed at just the the friendliness of people, just the just just kind, just the kindness everywhere we went. Not just one place, like every and even today, throughout the whole day, people have been so kind and so generous uh, and so helpful. Just it's it's just amazing. And so, and I was kind of you know, because it, it's it's a relationship. We're trying to understand if this is, go, you know, if this is a, a right fit, just like in a relationship. And so testing, you know, kind of testing it out last week when I was up here, I was like, wow, it's a pretty great place. And so today it was being in the schools and I wanted to see, hey, you know, the things that people are saying positively about the school district, I wonder how that plays out in the school. Wow. Like, just wow. I don't know if you guys realize what you have here. It was so amazing being in the schools, right? Um, one of the comments in the leadership profile said, you know, there is joy and happiness in the district. And I was like, well, that's interesting, okay. Um, let me see how that plays out. I, I wanna see what that looks like in the schools. And that's exactly what I saw, joy and happiness. It was incredible. And I don't mean just one classroom, I mean, every single classroom. Teachers were joyous in the work that they were doing with students. Students were joyous in the way that they were working with each other and interacting with the teacher. It was such a wonder, the, the, the whole staff, the, everybody was incredibly welcoming and positive. And some of them that didn't even know I was there. Like we walked in, we went in the classroom and they were just, it was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. It, it is a gift to have such an amazing community that supports its schools in that way. And I think that, that, you know, that is what can galvanize a community forward to help move forward and, you know, understand the resiliency of the district, of the community. Like, I've just been amazed today, and I can't even tell you, every single person, Every single person, um, they live in the district. They have kids that go to the district. You know, um, they, they they had kids even just in this meeting I just had, right? We have mom of the year back there that did like everything. You know, she was the you know, the, the band mom. She was this. You know, she has kids in the district, and everybody has such a passion for the work that they do here. It doesn't matter what it is. They have such a passion. That's amazing. Like you just don't see that all over the place. So it, it's a real gift, and it was a very, it was very much a gift today. 
to be able to be in the schools, to see the students, um, to see the teachers. And your students are brilliant, just brilliant. Like we had lunch with the high school students and they were asking the best questions. I'm like, wow, how, are you really only a high school student? Because I didn't even know what the superintendent was when I was in high school. I'm like, what is that? I have no idea. So it was such a, it was a great day, an exhausting day, <laughs> but, but a great day. So I appreciate the opportunity. So um, I don't know, and, and I'm not sure, I kind of said this before at my previous interview, um, I have two children. I have a daughter who's 24, a son who's 22. My son is graduating, thank goodness, from the University of Tampa this year. Um, and he was a senior during when the pandemic hit, so he kind of lost his senior year. And that really sent him in a tailspin. And so we had to get a lot of wraparound support for him so that he could um, be successful. And that was, that was a community. Like we had to have a, a community wraparound um, for him to get him at, um, to where he wanted to be. And so he graduates this year. So I'm super excited about that. Uh, I have two dogs. They're still bad dogs. Um, they, they went to doggy reform school and it didn't take, so. <laughs> but they're adorable. Um, and then I have two cats um, and a therapy bunny. So, yeah. So that's me. Um, is there anything else you think? Is there anything you want to know about me and my experience? As you can see, I'm very open with <laughs> pretty much too much. Because if not, I have questions. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. So can you speak to um, your experience today and, and what you've seen and heard? And what do you feel like would be the biggest challenge if you yeah. were to be given this role? Yeah. So, and this was, this was pretty consistent. And it actually goes to one of my questions. Because um, I went through the comments from the community. And one of the statements said, need to understand the divide in the community. Um, and students, I would say the students spoke, spoke most eloquently about this. They're just so smart. Um, that they were worried about this. They were worried that, um, that there were groups of people you know, kind of butting heads and it was creating challenges for them and their ability to, um, to move forward. Um, and so they asked me about that. They asked me, they wanted to know, like, what are you gonna do? And I said, well, first thing I have to do is I have to understand it. I, I, I'm not in the community, so I need to find out, you know, where this is coming from, um, what is, you know, I've watched the board meetings. I hear the public comment, which you know I appreciate public comment. Um, and those are individuals who are vocal, which I think is great. I think there are many perceptions, many, many perspectives that need to be encouraged to, to be shared, right? Because just because I'm the loudest one in the room doesn't mean that my, my thoughts are most valuable. Everybody has value. Um, and it's important to hear where people are coming from. And so um, it's really getting that, I, I need to understand, like I would need to understand what are all the perspectives um, and not just lean into one venue of people sharing their thoughts. I need to hear from a whole lot of people. And so that's, I think one of the su suggestion was holding a town hall meeting there's like some other suggestions in here. I think that's great. Um, you know, any opportunity to hear from people about the divide and what are their thoughts on, you know, how that divide get, you know, how people can be brought together, um, I think would be really helpful to better understand that. Is, is that something you wanna to try to understand tonight? Um, I think that takes, that's going to be a deep dive, right? Okay. Um, like I said, I've, I've watched the board meetings and um, I appreciate 
the transparency and honesty and I think that like you can feel the emotion you can just feel it in what they're talking about um, and so I think it would I think it would take a deeper dive than we have tonight but I would say that I'm willing to hear like okay. I'm willing to learn I'd agree with you that it's going to be one of your biggest challenges yeah so I think you're keyed in to that very well yeah. um, I brought something for you to take with you um, and it's just my um, interpretation of some of the things that have gone on and okay. some of the reasons behind the divide okay so it's just um, something for you to take home and I appreciate that um, and um, some of the things that I've witnessed paying attention so okay. um, yeah and there's just a lot of um, history yeah. and things that have happened so yeah. um, when you talk about coming from a district where the students are experiencing ongoing trauma based on things happening at home or you mentioned uh, weapons being brought into your school and things um, and I think about the trauma here mm. Um, it's very different yeah so I'm hoping that you can somehow get a feel for maybe you toured the high school and and maybe you walked the 200 hall and and maybe you sort of tried to put yourself in the moment of what some of our students and staff went through because um, it's just very uh, intense yeah. and our students are not like normal students in some ways um, I've noticed if lights get turned off um, it's very unsettling yeah. for our students um, even at, at lower grade levels people get scared mm -hmm. and I think more so than other schools there's an edge people are on edge yeah. because of what happened here and everybody knows what happened um, in, in pretty great detail in some cases. Yeah. You know, my kids are little and, and they know a lot about what happened. So um, it's just uh, something you're going to have to really immerse yourself in, unfortunately, mm -hmm. in, in our world yeah. of uh, pain. Yeah. So it's, uh, it was in the news today. The families and things you'll read about it so it's just um, everyone's in a different place yeah so I don't know how much of a percentage of your time you'll spend on it compared to normal day-to-day -day business you are seeing a lot of the wonderful things happening and the learning and the joy and the happiness and then um, we also have four students who are no longer here and everything that goes along with that and we don't want to forget that absolutely so that's um, just going to be a part of your job here yeah. and um, I'll just I'll pass it back I just want to say I watched all three interviews and I was just so um, impressed with you Thank and you. I think you were the only candidate who expressed condolences to us here in Oxford and it meant a lot to me so thank you you're welcome I would just like to um, see how how you feel about how important is it to you that we emphasize programs like social emotional learning, uh, Forty Two Strong. I don't know. Have you heard of Forty Two mm -hmm. Strong? Yeah. yeah. How important is it to you that we continue to support? plans that that affect all students not just our academic achievements but yeah. all, students. all students yeah thank you for the question um, so social emotional um, wraparound services have been needed for a long time um, it's not when I was teaching in the classroom um, it was not acceptable to, e even though I knew <laughs> that's what our kids needed, 
you know, we had to focus only on academics, that it wasn't, you know, I wasn't allowed to, you know, find out what was happening, you know, with a student and, and reach out to the counselors. And, and, and I thought, golly, that's just wrong. You know, how do I teach somebody who, you know, had, had a traumatic event the night before? Like, what, what? That doesn't make any sense. And so when it, the social emotional standards came out um, in Ohio, um, it almost gave us the permission. Like, finally, like we knew this is what kids needed, right? All along, we knew that we couldn't just lean heavily into academics and not take the whole child into consideration. They're one and the same. Like, like a kid cannot be academically successful without feeling a sense of belonging, without feeling safe, without, you know, all of the things that go with that. Um, and so I'm very much appreciative that people have began to understand, have begun to understand the importance of social emotional support and wraparound services, because now it's an integrated part of everything we do. I saw that today. It's an integrated part. Like to even be able to tease it out, it, why, why, you, why would you do that ever? Because you can see how important it's become to the climate and culture of the buildings, of the schools, and the, and the, the students. I met the, the uh, facility dogs, which were amazing. Oh my God, I'm in love. Um, and, and just to see the students' reactions around the dogs and the, the sense of safety that they felt, just like, you know, from a psychological safety standpoint. So to me, it, it's not, it, it's, it's not even a part of the conversation about removing those things because it's so critical to su the success of children. Well, there, there is and there has been some opposition to this, and I wonder, to the social-emotional learning, yeah. how would you handle that? I am a data-driven person, right? And so my question would be, if we have, the evidence that we have that social emotional support and restorative practices and trauma informed care is having a positive impact on students, right? Because we have that data. What data indicates that it would not be a good idea? Like, if we removed it, <laughs> what data is there? You know, we have to make informed decisions about what we do or do not do with students and understand that, um, you know, there are consequences to the decisions that we make as, as a system, as adults. Um, and so we need to get as much information as possible. So that's my question. So my question would be, um, if a program, you know, it, it, if there's a, a proposal to remove a program, I'd, I'd have to know what evidence indicates that that's a good decision, right? I try not to be closed-minded about things. Like I, I really want to um, honor people's thoughts and understandings about what they think should and should not happen in schools or should and should not happen with kids. But we all have, have our opinions, right? And opinions are our opinions, and, and we have a right to our opinions. But there's a difference between an opinion and an informed opinion. And so the question would be, what information do we have that we can bring to the table that could help us make a better decision. There is so much research on the importance of um, socio-emotional support for students. Um, I'd be interested in seeing what additional information or research is out there that would provide a different perspective. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess I have a, two questions. Okay. Uh, well, the first, I'll just, um, what you said about joy and happiness. Mm. So there is a lot of joy and happiness yeah. in the district. There are a lot of great things about For sure. the district. The programs, the arts, the athletics, the music, you name it. There's a lot of great things. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of great teachers and support staff and and administration in the district. Yeah. Uh, 
Pam is one of them. Yeah, I know. I saw that today. Like, everybody uh, knows Pam. Yeah. <laughs> Hugs um, galore. <laughs> and with that, there is a lot of pain. And I guess a couple things. For those of us who are vocal and coming to board meetings or coming to venues like this to speak, we are not alone. We are not just a handful of people. There are hundreds behind us, beside us. They just may not be here. There are hundreds of untold stories of the kids that don't come to school on Tuesdays, or maybe they only come half a day, or maybe they don't come the first two days after a break, mm -hmm. or maybe they have to change their classes so that they're not in the 200 wing. There's untold stories of teachers struggling in therapy, whatever, like, there's untold stories, but there's happiness around it. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure, you know, not only to you, but to the other candidates watching and to those in the room, there's hundreds of untold stories of trauma that is not seen every day yeah. um, that we need acknowledged. We need, um, we need acknowledged and we need those recovery services and we need to feel confident about them mm -hmm. and we need to be confident that they're there. Um, you know, there's, there's students have spoken out about a false sense of security, right? Like, we need their voices heard. They need to be able to speak without, uh, without fear. Hmm. There's fear. Some people need to talk about it to heal. Others, maybe they don't talk about it. They need to do something else. Um, I think it's really important not to, not to think that, you know, the handful of people speaking out of the board meetings are the only ones. We're not, we're not alone, there's hundreds. When you, when you log into the video, you can see hundreds of people watching and supporting and saying thank you and thank you for speaking because we can't. So I just wanna, I think it's very important for you to know that, I think it's very important for all the candidates to know that. So amongst all this happiness and joy, there's mm -hmm. a lot of sadness and there's anger. And I think that's important. Yeah. You mentioned, um, you know, being a good listener. And again, you've listened to board meetings, so what is, that, what is it that you hear the community telling you, asking for? Mm -hmm. what, what, you know, it, from what you've heard, what is your interpretation thus far, I guess? Yeah. I mean, what are you hearing? Yeah. So the number one word that I hear is accountability, mm -hmm. right? So accountability is a very broad term right so from a, a, a leadership standpoint accountability working with students in some cases is i'm going to have a here are here are the behavior norms and here's what you did and i'm going to have a conversation with you to kind of get you back you know where you need to be um as far and accountability can go as far as you know termination of employment like they're there it's very broad so I think that um, there, there needs to be clarity around what that ac accountability looks like. <laughs> like I have to, I would have to have an understanding of what that looks like, right? Um, and what is needed to move forward. Um, and there are parameters, legal parameters to which, you know, schools operate as far as their hiring practices and whatnot. Um, and so there are challenges to some of those things, but it would take a better understanding of what the request is and what, what would be needed in order to accomplish that request. Um, so that's, that's what I, I've heard. Um, I've heard the students speak at the December board meeting. Um, I was very impressed with the students. And, you know, I couldn't even imagine at that age coming to a board meeting. I, I, I'm sure I didn't even know what a board meeting was at that age. But they were there advocating for what they wanted and what was important for them. And I think it's really, it's critical to listen to our students and what they need and what they think um, we need to move forward. And so those are the things, um, but I also heard a teacher, you know, a former teacher come and talk about leading with love. 
that's important that we figure out how to lead with love. Um, so there's a diversity uh, of things that are being shared. What I'm not hearing is from a community standpoint, we are in this together and we need to figure out how to move forward together. And that's why I wanted to have a better understanding about that divide because it's very unhealthy for a community to be in that space for an extended period of time um, and will end up destroying the community. And what I've heard today from people is how important this community is to them as an individual, as someone who, who lives here, works here, has children here, it's so important to them and it is definitely doing damage and so figuring out how to move together and what that looks like um, and, and how do you do it in a non-divisive way like and, I, and I'm not saying I'm sitting here having the answers because I don't but what I'm saying is that there is a way forward but we have to find it together. And that's messy and it's painful. But in order to have a brighter future, it's essential. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes. Kind of, sort of? No, it, it did. Okay. <laughs> Just one last comment, yeah. I guess. Um, I believe, and, and even for myself, who happens to be vocal, and I, 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 I support the district, and I'm and I'm also very vocal in seeking accountability, and I've also tried to be very clear on what that looks like. I am moving forward, right? Like, there, are, my way of moving forward is maybe different than somebody else's sure. way, but I'm moving forward. So there, there is maybe this misconception that we're not moving forward. We are, mm. but we're moving forward in different ways. Sure. We're moving forward supporting our children that are still walking the halls. We're moving forward supporting the victims' families, all 12 of them. Yeah. We're moving forward supporting all the staff, but while we move forward, we're seeking accountability. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just had a question. How do you feel your working relationship should be with your volunteer groups in all of your buildings. I mean, they're a lot of times the core of what goes on yeah. on the extras in your buildings. And how um, do you feel your involvement with them should be um, with your PTOs and your PSAs and your boosters? Yeah. Because there's a lot of parents behind all that that do all the extras in the buildings for the staff and for the kids and for the district. And just what do you think that should look like with you as well yeah. working alongside them? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, they need to be celebrated because they are an essential part of the schools and, and the um, you know, support that schools need. And so I would, I would say that my interaction and, and work with them would be integral in what I do, right? Uh, so being in the schools, knowing their names, knowing what they do, knowing their contributions, you know, here's a phrase for you, thank you. <laughs> you know, thank you for your service. Thank you for the work that you do every day for kids. Um, and I think that for all individuals who work in the schools, and so I don't necessarily separate people out like this is somebody who does this so they're more valuable than that person who no you're all valuable you're all a critical component of the success of our students and so celebrating them working alongside of them for the betterment betterment of the schools and the student experience <laughs> Since you are data driven, um, this question kind of goes to your philosophy. Number one, um, what experience do you have with the IB program? Mm -hmm. And then we are going through budget cuts in the next few years. With that being said, we spend a great deal of money on the IB program. Yeah. Since only 13 kids graduated full IB last year, is IB something you feel that we should continue as a district? 
also would you be willing to ask the staff and community if ib is still the right path for our district as many people are divided on that mm. yeah that's a good question so we we do not in columbus we do not have ib k-12 like they do here which i just am amazed by that um, and looking at how it's embedded in the curriculum and the work that students do at the elementary um, we have it primarily as a as a pathway at the high school um, in one of our high schools and so i am intrigued by the curriculum and the concept of critical thinking for students um, which is kind of the foundation of the program. I would also say the data piece is very important, right? And, and not just student success data, you know, graduating with 13 kids, you know, in the IB program. It's also the rigor of the program. It's also the character building of the program. So I think there's a multitude of data points that could be useful. Um, on the other hand, I think it's also important, um, we hold dear to the things that we know. And it's very hard um, to let go of them. If the data, quantitative and qualitative, indicates that that's the direction that we need to go as a district, it's important to have that information to people, you know, for people to see. Like, this is, you know, what we're doing um, as far as an IB program in the district. This is, this is how it's run in the district. Here's data that we've collected regarding the programming. Here's how much it costs for the programming. And given the financial challenges that are happening right now with, with budget cuts and whatnot, we have to weigh those things. We have to understand if we need to cut back financially, it has to happen somewhere. And so if we have data that indicates that we have a program that is significantly benefiting students, you know, academically or otherwise, and we have data that indicates that this program is not so much and we have to cut something, we're gonna look at the things that are not having as much of an impact upon, even though we're, we're, they're near and dear to our hearts, right? Um, it's kind of what education went through when, you know, standardization and the standards came through for different grade levels, you know, especially those people who really love to teach about dinosaurs in the elementary level, right? They had to give up their dinosaur unit. They were very upset about that. They were passionate about that. But the reality is, is, you know, is that as significant as this other standard, right? It was hard for them to change. Um, and so we're passionate about things that we know, things that we've seen, things that we've taught. But we also have to look at the bigger picture and, and make decisions according, accordingly. So I would say data is important. I would say there are a variety of data points that would need to be explored regarding any programming whatsoever. I definitely heard a lot about IB today and you know different perspectives regarding IB today. And so um, I would say it would be a tough conversation to have, but it, if it was necessary, it would be a conversation that would be had um, with the data and the evidence as to why decisions would be made. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I just want to make sure it is considered. Oh, for sure, because, of course. Um, I don't want it to be necessarily IB or the highway. You know, for sure. We need to have that conversation. Yeah. I do feel is great in the elementary program. Okay. Um, the PYP program is phenomenal. As we go up through the grades, I'm not sure that the IB is taught the, the right way or um, with the intent for being such a small number of people, um, just something to ponder. And Absolutely. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. To the right. I don't don't follow up on data. If that's oh, okay. okay. <laughs> sorry. No, it's okay. No, it's okay. It's a response. Um, so, oh, sorry. How do I send this to him? Oh, here it is. Is that going to work? Is that going to work? 
you go. Um, okay, so you mentioned you're data driven. Yeah. I, I would say data informed. Data informed. <laughs> <Okay>. so, <laughs> I, I personally think that that's one thing that leads to building trust in the district, whether mm -hmm. it's superintendent to board, superintendent to administration, superintendent to community. Yeah. So, and it's, I, I, Danielle's opinion is it's lacking. Um, it's improved, but it's still not where it needs to be, especially in light of um, the tragedy. Yes. So data around safety, um, again, whether it's programming data, attendance data, um, we've, we've gotten some information more on threat assessment now, so bringing visibility to that, which is good, suicide assessments, but there's still a general lack of bringing data forward and maybe not in a timely manner. So my question to you is, what does that look like to you? As a superintendent, how do you then envision bringing data forward to the board, mm -hmm. to the administration, and also to the community? Because again, it's helping, it would help, and in some cases is helping restore trust, mm -hmm. but we're not there yet. For sure, yeah. So, Data is best served when you're using it to answer a question, right? And so it would depend on the questions being asked, right? So when it comes down to budget and modifying budget, the data that's going to be important is essentially the way that we refer to it is return on investment, right? So this program costs X number of dollars and this is the outcome we're getting, right? Now, sometimes we don't pay much, but we get great outcomes. That's ideal, right? <laughs> you know, in a financial situation. Sometimes it's like this, and sometimes it's like this, right? Where you're spending a lot of money for very little outcome. And I, th I think when you're talking from a budgetary standpoint, those things are important. Um, and for us, in our board legislation, when we go to spend money, you know, taxpayers' money, there's a whole section right there that says, what is the return on investment? How do we know that this is worth spending this amount of money, right? And so, again, I think presenting, like, like you can present any data, but it's only significant in the context of what question are we asking. So I'd, I'd have to see, you know, what are the questions that are being asked? Like, what are the questions that the community has that they need? You know, data is important. Um, and it's, it's important to be transparent about it. And so if, if, uh, you know, if the board has a question, if the community has a question, what data do we have to answer that question? That's what I would say. Um, I had two things. One was when the board was choosing three finalists and they were discussing you. Yeah. Did you watch it? I did. Okay. <laughs> so they, um, it, like one of the concerns was like Dr. Milligan said that her strength is not like paperwork or something. Would you like a chance to um, <laughs> like? I said it wasn't my forte. You know how to like do paperwork. <laughs> Um, in hopes of being hired. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay. That was very. That was very nice. Yeah. I figured you'd probably and then mm -hmm. um, my other question was: Okay, so when you look at the size of Oxford compared to um, City of Columbus, mm. like what are you most excited about? Like with the size of the schools and being able to visit all of them, like potentially in one day, or like yeah. um, what would a what would a school visit look like to you, or what are you most excited about, like the programs and the buildings yeah. and the people, and what are you what are you most excited about? Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Appreciate the opportunity to clarify. <laughs> um, I I would like the, the to meet the person who says that paperwork <laughs> is their forte. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I think what I meant by that was the um, question, if I recall it correctly, was you know how will you ensure that that you're out in the buildings and you're with the students and you're you're you know in the classrooms and meeting people and getting out in the community and. My, if I recall, my response was, you know, that's my preference. I would rather be doing that than doing paperwork, right? 
that doesn't mean I don't do paperwork. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, I have quite a bit that I'll, I'll need to get back to. I'll probably be up till min midnight getting it done tonight because it has to get done. But it, it it's easier for me because I enjoy it more being out in the community and being with kids and teachers and schools and all. I'm like, oh, I love that part. It's grueling. Like, I have to force myself. Like, okay, it's time to sit in front of the computer and get all this stuff done. Um, but I am quite proficient at getting it done. It's just not my joy um, in getting it done. So that's kind of, hopefully that provides some clarity <laughs> regarding that response. Um, and then I would say, you know, I am excited to have an opportunity to be a part of a community. Like, I miss that. When I was at the principal at the high school, I was so close with my families and my students. And, you know, I, I just, we did home visits. Um, you know, when our students were struggling, um, one of my students, I just love him dearly, he wasn't able to attend graduation because um, his um, mental health challenges, he just was really struggling. And so we bought, brought graduation to him. Like, my teachers and I went over there and, and we, you know, had a graduation celebration there for him. Um, and I miss that. And, and that's what I look forward to the most, is being a part of a community um, and just being able to know the kids and know the families. Um, you know, I, I've done a bazillion football games in my career. Um, and my favorite thing was to see our families there and talk with them and, you know, in an informal setting and just get to know them and get to talk about their kids and they're so proud of their kids. And it's just so wonderful to be a part of a community. And when your community is 45,000 people, it's really hard, but it's, you know, a, a community this size, I would look forward to that. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Dr. Milligan, you've Sir. spent time researching our district, and yeah. today you spent time here. What, after doing all this research, what would your vision for our school district be if you were the superintendent? Yeah. So, here's what I'm going to say to that. It can't be my vision. It has to be our vision, right? A, a vision is a collective understanding of the direction we're going. It's I do not think it's appropriate for somebody to come into a district and say, here's my vision, let's go, come on, rah, rah. No. What are we, you know, right now the way that the vision stands, it, it talks about global citizens, you know. Um, is that currently the value of the school district, of the people in school, of the community, right? It's really about the community's vision espoused by the superintendent, right? And how do I galvanize that process? And so I suspect the very first thing that I would do would be, do we need to revisit the vision and the mission, right? From what I understand, they, they've been in existence for an extended period of time. So are they still, the way that they're written, is, is that the, the vision of the community? Is that the vision, is that the mission of the, of the community? Because if it's not, there are processes we can put in place to modify them, you know, from a community standpoint. Because once again, I, I said this in my first interview, the type of, of leader I am, which is a servant leader, I'm here to serve, right? And I'm here to serve the community. So it's about the community and how do we come together to create that vision for the community, you know, it was so amazing just to meet so many people today, you know, who went to the schools here, who graduated from here, who teach here, who work here, whose children, like, I don't know if I've ever been to a community like that before. So it can't be about me. It has to be about the community. And that's the work that I would lean heavily into is how do we define that for the community? Probably not the answer you're wanting. <laughs> No, it's that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I, I want your honest assessment. That was honest. <laughs> So 
coming from out of state, mm. and especially not in this area, you may have kind of already hinted to this, but what especially draws you to Oxford Community Schools, and especially the position of a potential superintendent yeah. of this district, maybe even just outside of you know, being ID or having you know, great programs, what, what has drawn you to that position here in Oxford? Yeah. I would say the number one thing is the, the passion for the schools. Like, I don't think I've ever heard community members speak so passionately about their schools. Like, they are, it, it, this, like, they own them in their hearts. Like, this is our schools and we want great schools. You know, we love our children and we want great opportunities for our children. Um, that's a draw. I want to be a part of that. <laughs> you know, who wouldn't want to be a part of that? That's amazing. Um, and I want to be a part of the healing process and the moving forward process, whatever that looks like, um, because I've seen the outcome of that. You know, when, when a community is able to come together and move forward, um, together, figure it out together. Um, it's a really powerful process um, because the other side of pain and trauma is hope, right? And, and joy and happiness. Like, but you have to get through all of that to get on the other side. And it's a process that I would love to be a part of. Hi. Hi. Um, we had uh, three kids um, in the building on the 30th. And, um, you know, three different healing paths, three different perspectives. Two of them have graduated. Um, one of them has kind of burned the bridge and doesn't want to be a part of Oxford anymore. Um, and, like, I work in the building and um, not, not the high school, but I, I'm a staff member here. We've lived in the community for 25 years. Um, we're, we're deeply embedded in this community. Um, and we have a junior right now, and she's not gonna be the loudest voice. Um, and when you look at her saber, she's fine. And when you look at her grades, she's fine. Um, but she's not fine. And so she has had a really tough time this year, and she's not sure what next year looks like for her, but she kind of feels like she's trapped. Um, she doesn't want to be the weird kid um, at a different school. She doesn't want to be in the building. She doesn't think she can do OVA. She has teachers that she trusts and that she loves. How do you reach that kid? How do you connect with that kid and get her to buy back in? Because she fills out the sabers in the way that's going to make her scores look great, mm. right? Um, but there's so much more to that. So how do you get her to buy back in and how do you, do you have a plan to connect with the kids who aren't going to be the loudest voices? Yeah, and I apologize, I keep going back and forth, I'm so sorry. So, and actually the students brought that up today. Like they're just so smart. Um, Cause they talked about that, they wanted to know how we could give a voice to students who aren't the ones in the room and what do they do? And actually they came up with a brilliant idea. They were like, you know, when we come together, cause they meet with the superintendent every month, they're like, could we bring someone? Like, could we bring someone that we feel has something important to say so that they could come and, and have, you know, an opportunity to share their thoughts? And I thought, you guys are so smart, <laughs> you know? So there are strategies like that, but I guess the number one strategy I would say is, um, does your student have relationships with adults in the building that she feels comfortable talking with? Yes and no. She has teachers that she trusts. Yeah. I don't know which is which is huge for her because yeah. for her the school is not a safe place for sure okay um i don't i don't know that she trusts them with that she Got trusts it. them with the funny and with the i'm going to talk to you and yeah. i i'm going to have a relationship with you but it's going to be it's going to stop 
Yeah. At some point. Yeah. Because the students that we've been successful reconnecting to their educational pathway, typically it came down to someone who had a really positive relationship with them um, and listened and understood with no judgment on what that student wanted um, and needed. And because um, we had quite a few students in, in the high school that I was the principal who would disappear. They would just would stop coming to school. And it typically took one of us going to their home, to their work site, um, talking with them, finding out what's happening, um, and trying to figure out what they need. And you as, as their parent are actually the number one advocate to help us better understand um, it and how we can leverage those relationships to support the students. Um, it's a tough age regardless. It's just really tough. And to add, you know, the, the tragedy on top of that is just, it, it's unfathomable um, what kids are going through. It's, it's hard to understand. But from a, you know, clearly you're very supportive and you, and you want to make sure your student has what she needs. And so even partnering with whomever you think your, your child has a positive relationship with, and being a, a, a part of that um, conversation and seeing if, if your daughter is comfortable with that, you know? You know, what teacher do you trust? I trust, you know, Mr. Smith, whomever. Um, you know, is it okay if we maybe sit down and just talk, you know, with Mr. Smith and, and maybe we can talk through some of the things you're, you're dealing with and figure out what might be some next steps um, I did a, a lot with our counselors. Um, we have amazing counselors in Columbus, and they were my number one go-to, right? So if a student wasn't comfortable talking to me, they typically were really comfortable talking with their counselor um, and partnering with the family, because you know your child best. And so what information might you share with us to be able to support your student. Um, that's typically the, the number one, my go-to strategy when it comes to those situations, but it really has mostly to do with relationships and the positive relationships and kids being feeling comfortable sharing that vulnerable information. And if they don't feel comfortable sharing the vulnerable information, maybe partnering with families to see how we might be able to support the child. But I've gone through that so many times for a multitude of reasons, right? Um, but the ultimate goal is that students have options for the future um, and finding a way to support them in, in having those options. Um, I've been known to find kids at their work site. Like I live in the area where I was the principal um, and if I hadn't seen a student in school, I felt like I was the Pied Piper of my area because I'd like, you know, get them and like, okay, let's go to school. Let's go figure out what's going on. Um, because I know how important getting a high school diploma is, you know, for opportunities in the future. And it's just trying to figure out how to connect with kids in ways that are meaningful for them so that you can support them. That answer your question, mm -hmm. kind of sort of. Kind of sort of, yeah. yeah. Now, it's a great question, a great question, and I'd love to, you know, afterwards if you want to talk one on one. I'd love yeah. to. Sorry, I have another question. Yeah. So in these last few years, we have heard from administration numerous times that they are receiving expert advice on such and such, such and such, such and such, um, but if we don't really get specifics from that, um, who it was, why they chose that, whatever. So I guess this is kind of a loaded question in that expecting that you're gonna hit moments where you're gonna not know what to do with a certain circumstance and maybe you feel like you need to seek some professional or outside advice. What would your plans be for that? Um, maybe what resources would you consider? Um, would you consider sharing that information with the district? Yeah. I know that's kind of a very complicated question, but yeah. we, you know, those are the things that we need to hear Absolutely. from our administration, yeah. um, especially due to the tragedy or even during 
even because of COVID and the effects COVID has had on our children. Um, and again, we just would expect that you're going to need to seek outside advice mm. on how to help support the students and staff members and what would that look like yeah. potentially to yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, I would equate that to when you're having conversation with somebody and they say research says, I get that a lot, right? Well, research says that da 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 da. Well, my next question is, what research, right? Because I, I'm a, 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 like, I like research, I like thinking about it, but just because you say research says it, doesn't mean that it's accurate research. Like we know that research can run the gambit of, you know, <laughs> accurate research or not. Um, so I would say the same thing holds true in that if expertise is sought, what expertise? Like what makes them an expert? And they're not an expert because I said they're an expert. Like what is it about their credentials? What, it is, what is it about their work? Um, that makes them the expert. You know, one of the things I said in my interview was, you know, as adults, we need to understand the why. Like, what's the why? You know, why are you, you going this direction? Why are you making this decision? And if the why is, well, we received expert information. Okay, what expert information, right? Are they expert? Is it expert information just because you said it is? You know, so again, it goes back to transparency and providing information to the community so they can understand the decision and understand and make their own, you know, um, understanding of the material. Like, what's the benefit of hiding that information? That doesn't make sense to me. And sometimes asking multiple experts, not just one person or one, and like one. Mm -hmm entity of, you for know, sure. for what they think and then taking their response and running yeah, with it, especially right. not knowing what their true background is and if they really can relate to what's happened here. So I think it's wise to seek multiple perspectives and opinions for sure. on some of the decisions you may have to make. And in research, that's often referred to as triangulating the data. Like you don't just seek one data point, you seek multiple data points and establish a pattern, right? So if you had three different researchers um, that presented information about trauma-informed schools, what is similar across all of them? Like instead of saying, well, it's this one because I like it the best and you know, it was written the way I understand it, it's, well, what data, well, for, first, what are the research methods? What data across the board is similar in this one to this one? What are the limitations? of the research and the limitations of the data, right? And, the, and I think those are all important questions to ask because we, if we're expecting our students to be critical thinkers, shouldn't we be critical thinkers as well? And asking questions is a part of being a critical thinker. Okay, honoring our time. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's been, whew, wow. And I still got that paperwork to do, so. <laughs> Surprise, you're not leaving. <laughs> <laughs> we do have QR codes if you would like to provide your feedback for the board. Um, and then tomorrow night, same time here, and Wednesday night, same time here. So, tomorrow night is Mr. Cormac Glenn. And Wednesday is David Rowley. And thank you for being here. I appreciate thank you, you and I appreciate your questions. Thank you.